Welcome to another session of Lectures by Lobezy. I'm your host, Dr. Lobezy. Thanks for joining me for this episode. Today we're going to be talking about European uh, exploration. Really just going to discuss uh, the motivations, three factors that contributed to overseas exploration as well as the technology uh, that made it possible. First, uh, a good way to remember this, um, the factors that contributed to it, uh, God, glory, and gold, or God, gold, and glory. Um, going to jump in those, jump into those three motivations. Um, all right, so <clears throat> we've covered a lot already this year. Um, talked a lot about uh, the role that the Middle Ages uh, played in shaping European society. We know that at least during part of the Middle Ages, uh, trade between East and West, Europe and Asia, had had slowed. Um, and that it was the Crusades that sort of resumed that trade. Um, but something else we need to focus on was that the uh, Silk Road was restored by the Mongols. Okay, so Genghis Khan uh, and the Mongols helped establish that. Um, somebody who, a European who's noteworthy, that talked a lot about the wealth of Asia was none other than Marco Polo, who, with his father and uncle, uh, traveled to China and spent some years uh, in the capital with uh, the then leader, Kublai Khan. And uh, when he returned, he wrote a, you know, what we'll call like a, you know, a, a best-selling book about his, uh, his travels. And that uh, really struck a chord with Europeans. Um, create a lot of interest in the wealth uh, of Asia and uh, just motivated some interest, okay? And that's going to lead people to uh, begin exploring uh, down the road, okay? So that's just kind of a, a factor unto itself. But um, what really, uh, when it comes to wealth or seeking wealth, the, the gold, if you will, what really motivated uh, Europeans uh, to begin seeking ways to reach Asia, uh, especially by sea, was when after Constantinople fell in 1453 by the Ottoman Turks. It wasn't just Constantinople that collapsed, but it was all the, the, the rest of the Byzantine Empire. And so that territory was uh, taken over by uh, the Ottoman Turks. And so the European or the Italian city-states that had conducted uh, trade for centuries, um, primarily uh, Venice and Genoa, were more or less blocked uh, and prevented from uh, trading. Okay, they were kind of uh, kicked out of the, the trade between um, China, India, and, and the rest of sort of the Near East. And what little trade there was uh, led prices to be like doubled. Okay, and so that's going to lead um, countries to, to begin or just brave individuals to seek other routes, okay? And whoever could do that uh, would make a great force. The second motivating factor was the desire uh, to spread Christianity. Uh, in a previous unit, we also talked about uh, the Crusades, 1096 to 1270, uh, roughly. Uh, there was an attempt by Europeans uh, to regain control of the Holy Land or Palestine. Uh, they had some limited success, but uh, that, that sort of crusading spirit uh, spread after the Crusades uh, to uh, southwestern Europe, more specifically the Iberian Peninsula, and more specifically modern-day Spain and Portugal. Um, you may recall uh, from the first unit this year, uh, we talked about the spread of the Islamic Caliphate, first uh, to the um, Arabian Peninsula, then across North Africa, and then into uh, Europe by way of the Iberian Peninsula. Um, even after they controlled that, uh, the Christians uh, attempted to regain control, kind of throw off the yoke of Islamic uh, rule. And what we see here is uh, three areas that successfully were able to uh, gain their independence, uh, Portugal, Castile, and Aragon. Uh, in red there in the southern portion of the Iberian Peninsula lies Granada, which was uh, the sort of the last stronghold of Muslim control. And uh, it was, of course, uh, following the marriage of um, 
Isabel of Castile to Ferdinand of Aragon that they were able to sort of unite their kingdoms uh, to defeat uh, Granada and complete what was known as the Reconquista, the reconquering of the Iberian Peninsula. And that was completed in 1492. Okay, so uh, what we start to see, especially with Portugal and then a newly united Spain, was uh, this desire to um, have national glory. Uh, and these were strong factors that led these uh, two countries to kind of lead the way with overseas exploration. And more specifically, we want to talk about uh, Prince Henry and the Navigator. Let me move my head first and out of the way. Sorry about that. Uh, anyway, he established um, third son of the King of Portugal, established in 1419 a, uh, a, a navigation school where he brought in uh, a lot of the cartographers or map makers, shipbuilders, astronomers, and just captains to sort of advance the technology of um, overseas uh, travel, maritime uh, travel and exploration. Uh, most of the experts in uh, were, were Italians, and that's because uh, they sort of dominated um, the sea trade in the Mediterranean with, um, with uh, uh, Asia. And um, so most of those were Italians, right, because of um, the Renaissance, right? Uh, it was the wealth that they made that sort of funded uh, those merchants that funded the Renaissance. Um, anyway, so we talk about Christopher Columbus kind of jumping forward. He was you know, one one of the misnomers about him was that he discovered that the earth was that the earth was round. No uh, people knew that. Uh, if we go all the way back to the first century astronom uh, astronomer Claudius Ptolemy, um, he surmised that in fact the earth was round. Um, and so most educated people, uh, sort of, you know, due to the rediscovery of his work uh, during the Renaissance, early part of the Renaissance, most people in the know knew that the earth was round. Uh, but the one thing that Ptolemy got wrong um, was, can't blame him, he was dealing with, you know, limited resources um, to, to know what he did know. Uh, he underestimated the size of the globe of the earth. Um, and then also, he knew nothing of the uh, continents outside of Europe, uh, Africa, and Asia. Okay. But at any rate... <clears throat> um, Moving on to the next slide, uh, it was in fact the Portuguese uh, that were able to begin the first uh, exploration and uh, travel outside of the Mediterranean uh, Sea. And they're gonna kind of first um, explore and then uh, colonize uh, some islands, uh, the Azores and then the Canary. And because of the tropical climate in these uh, uh, islands, they were able to grow sugarcane. And that was a commodity uh, that was, there was a high demand for it in Europe. And so that was what um, the Portuguese brought to those islands was sugarcane. Uh, because it was very labor intensive and because of the, the climate uh, in the tropics, uh, they began to import uh, slaves from Africa. So we'll be talking uh, in a later lesson uh, more specifically about the African slave trade. But it was uh, in 1441 uh, the Portuguese who first brought uh, African slaves uh, to these to these islands, the Canary and the uh, Azores. Um, because of the uh, missions uh, and voyages that Prince, Prince Henry the Navigator uh, funded, uh, we start to see uh, them slowly inching their way down the western uh, half of Africa. And um, by the time of his death, they had pretty much uh, made it to uh, the equator. Okay. Um, let's talk about uh, the tech technological advances that made uh, this uh, possible. Um, and it has to do with this ship, which you see pictured here in the slide, uh, the Caravel. This was uh, by no means the largest ship at the time. Um, the, the Chinese, uh, which we'll talk about later, and then the Ottoman, they had much larger ships, but it was the technology uh, within the ship that made it really the best of its time. So even though it was small, um, and in fact, that was a, an advantage because it allowed it to uh, sail uh, upriver uh, once it you know reached... Um, 
shore, it could it can navigate uh, because of its lighter weight, it can navigate up uh, uh, rivers. Uh, the other thing was um, it was a sturdy ship and it would uh, not capsize very often in storms. Okay, there's some other things that are noteworthy and that is the um, sails. The type of sails that this uh, ship utilized are called lateen or triangular sails. There were additional sails. Let me go up a slide. You can see that they have some square sails, but they also had these lateen sails. And so they could drop these various um, sails depending on the wind. So if they had a wind that was um, kind of blowing from behind them, they could uh, make sure that they hoist these square sails. But if, if the wind was sort of blowing at them in the direction that they wanted to go, they could lower the square sails and then lift these uh, lateen sails. And what that did was it allowed them to sail into the wind or tack uh, into the wind, all right? And this map, I think right here, again, let me move my head, um, shows the, uh, the ocean currents and along with that, the winds that are gonna prove to be problematic for uh, European explorers who wanna cross the Atlantic. Um, so essentially, you have to uh, sail pretty far south in order to catch uh, the currents and the winds to, to bring you uh, in a westerly direction. And then anything uh, north of that, the winds are going to blow back as well as the currents in an easterly direction. And so um, at any rate, uh, but just having triangular sails will kind of al allow you to sort of create a zigzag course even in directly into the winds. Before I move on, I want to go back uh, to something that I missed out on when I was uh, talking about Prince uh, Henry the Navigator. Anyway, uh, in his youth, uh, he was involved in a raid of a North African uh, city. Uh, here it is, uh, Ceuta. Uh, and it was there, you can see it on the map here as well, uh, that he came into contact with a, a, a vast amount of wealth um, and really didn't realize there was quite so much wealth that existed uh, in Africa. A lot of that was uh, indigenous, like the gold, but there was a lot of uh, other um, types of jewels and, and spices that weren't native. Um, but that was a huge trade corridor that he had come into contact with. And so he realized, like as his inspiration to establish that, um, navigational school that there was tremendous uh, wealth that could be exploited uh, if he were able to, um, you know, have Portuguese sailors take advantage of that. Uh, the other thing that he had learned uh, was there was a rumor of a uh, uh, Christian uh, African prince uh, by the name of Presser John, and uh, he thought that if he could find him, that they could uh, forge an alliance. Uh, the, uh, the, the Portuguese could with this Prester John and whatever his African kingdom was. Uh, and the goal would be uh, to attack the Ottoman and uh, defeat the Ottoman so that they could um, kind of take over the Indian Ocean trade uh, or the, uh, you know, sort of like the, 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 the Silk Road. Um, and so that's important uh, to note before we move forward. All right. Going back to the technology, let's talk about some of the instruments uh, that were uh, needed uh, to make overseas exploration possible. And the first is something called an astrolab, okay? And I have a couple examples uh, in, or illustrations below, but uh, not very familiar with these instruments, so I'm kind of going to wing it. But uh, the, the point is when you're out to sea, uh, you have nothing to go by to, um, you know, you don't have the land. Uh, if Once you get far out to sea and you no longer can see land, it's difficult to have your bearings. Um, and so you're very dependent upon the sun um, for your navigation and then at night, the, the night stars. So there were some instruments, uh, the Astrolab being one of them, that you could line it up with the horizon and then the star, and then there were some readings or some numbers uh, on this uh, instrument that would kind of let you know where you were as far as lines of latitude were concerned. And so 
That along with the magnetic compass uh, helped sailors not get lost and be able to kind of track their progress and stuff like that. Uh, and the next was um, a, an invention, uh, the axial rudder. So that goes in the rear of the ship and that just helps um, provide greater maneuver, uh, maneuverability. Uh, the other thing that the Caravelle had, and I didn't mention it, was it's not really a technology. I guess you can consider it a technology, was that these ships uh, had cannon uh, loaded onto them. And that they were the first of their kind to have that. All of the other ships that they encountered uh, did not have cannon. And so uh, once they uh, make their way around Africa and into the Indian Ocean, um, that feature is going to help them... Um, become more dominant and uh, drive out the Ottoman from the region. So that's really all I have uh, for this video. I appreciate it. Um, thanks for watching. See you next time.